Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Church of Brownsburg. It's good to have you here this morning. And uh, Rachel, thank you. That was wonderful. We appreciate that. A um, couple of thoughts for you this morning. One is, um, well, first of all, welcome. It's good to have you here today. And, uh, it's great to worship the Lord in times of plenty and uh, ease and relaxing. And it's also good to worship Him in times of stress and strain, the way it seems like it's been. It feels like this COVID thing has gone on for like a decade now. It hasn't been that long, but it feels like it, doesn't it? It's just like constantly kind of weighing in a way. So uh, anyway, it's good to worship the Lord. Uh, announcement about Ladies Bible Study. You'll see that starting January 19th at 7 p.m. That'll be by Zoom. Talk to Kathy Fisher if you have any questions about that. and encourage the ladies uh, to be a part of that. And I think that concludes our announcement. So one other announcement, just please pray for our presbytery. Again, we're trying to do this work in... There's a lot of ongoing work Presbyterian does examining pastors and dealing with theological issues, but it's, it's particularly complicated in the days of COVID to do that. You can just imagine, and maybe some of you experienced this, where you've got a meeting of 25 or 30 people, and they want to have a discussion, and doing that by Zoom with the delays and the who's talking, and it's really complicated. So we've been trying to do that together, and as we have those meetings, we do it in large sanctuaries, and it's like a little better. We met last time at Redeemer, which is a sanctuary that holds... 250 people, 500 people, 500 people. If you've been to Redeemer downtown, our sister church, and we had 25 people in a, a room that seats 500, and we're trying to have a discussion, you know. So, you know how that it loses something. Yes, let's just say that. So, please pray for our presbytery and uh, other bodies. I know some of you experience that in your work and uh, school and your personal lives. So, we we'll just continue to pray for the end, the conclusion of this pandemic. If you'll stand, our call to worship this morning is from Exodus 15. Recall the setting for this. So uh, Moses was called by the Lord to lead God's people out of captivity, out of bondage in Egypt. And so uh, uh, Pharaoh said, no, I don't think so. There were the seven plagues, and finally he relented. And so uh, Moses leads the people out, and the Lord guides them up against the Red Sea, trapped as it were. And Pharaoh sort of comes around, his heart is hardened even further and decides, let's go get him because we're not going to lose our slaves after all. Sends his soldiers up there. As they're approaching, the Israelites say to Moses, oh, this is brilliant. Like what, you brought us out here because there's more room to dig graves. Literally, that's their, that's what their reaction to this. And so the Lord says, basically, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then he parts the Red Sea uh, they cross over, as you know, the Egyptians follow, the soldiers and the sea um, uh, surges back together and drowns all of them. So suddenly you find yourself with your family and your best friends on the far side of the sea, and you've just seen your enemy destroyed, and they're sort of in their might. They've been destroyed, and it's just kind of the stunning work of God. And so here is a song that they sang, if you'll uh, read the bowl. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Please bow your heads with me. Lord, we come before you this morning to worship you. We uh, know that our worship is um, inadequate, uh, given your your infinite holiness, kindness to us, and your gloriousness. But this morning we pray that by the work of your Spirit, this would be pleasing to you and complete. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Our responsive reading then is from Deuteronomy 8, and this takes us a little further forward in the narrative, right? So the... um, Israelites now are spending considerable time in the wilderness, are about ready to enter the promised land. And so uh, the Lord gives this to Moses. Moses um, shares with them some, some words as they think about entering. And something for us to consider, when God is really good to us, at least me, maybe you've experienced the same thing, maybe not, uh, my thoughts of him tend to wane because life's good and it's comfortable and I don't need the Lord at that point. That's wrong, of course, (laughs) but that's what I tend to think. And then when life's tough, I cry out and say, Lord, where are you? Please help me. Please come. 
And so if I were the Lord, I would leave Keith in trouble a lot because then he's paying attention, right? But our God is good and he gives us seasons where we're not stressed and strained. We have rest in our lives and that's a kindness he shows to us. So let's read Deuteronomy 8 if you'll read the bold uh, responsibly. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and I have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do, to do you good in the end. Let, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is to this day. I praise God for that. So, hopefully, Keith will remember the Lord in the good times, too, um, and especially so. Uh, you'll see, we come to our time of confession, and if it's your heart's desire to again either remind yourself of your confession before Christ, having put all your sins on Him and His work on the cross, or maybe it's your first time and really seriously engaging with that, join me in this prayer of confession before the Lord. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forgive our sins. You call us to your glory and excellence, but we have so often spurned that call. You call us to Christ-likeness, and we would rather be comfortable than stay as we are. Forgive the sins that we remember and the sins we have forgotten. Have mercy on us and change us. Work in us that we might glorify you. Amen. Take a moment for silent confession. Hear this assurance of pardon from Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. for me as well. I'm glad you're here. Um, hope the Lord is blessing you. I'm glad you're healthy enough to be here. Um, glad to, that Keith's back with us and hope to see the rest of the past waters soon as they are healthy enough. Um, well, we have a chance once again to come together and we go to the Lord because the Lord is our God, of course. He is our king, but he is also our father, and the Bible is very clear that he loves us and that he listens to us. He hears us, and he says, you know, I want to answer your prayers. Now, that doesn't mean if I ask for a new car, he says, sure, 
He's not Scrooge McDuck. Uh, he is our God who knows everything perfectly. So that means he knows what's best for us. So when I ask for things, he says, I'm going to give you what you would ask for if you knew all that I knew. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we want to affirm that you are our God. You are the one who we worship, Lord. You are the one we bow our knees to. You are our creator, and you are the creator of all things. There are no other gods. We affirm that you are the sustainer of all things, that not an atom exists apart from your power. And you are our Redeemer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have called your people to yourself. And you continue to call a people to yourself. And for that, we praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, you went to the cross. We could not have done that. You suffered for us, those who have put their faith in you, the wrath of God. You are, as we've just sung, the sweet Lamb of God. Thank you that we can come and confess our sins to you and know already, even before we say the confession, that you forgive our sins because you are a God of steadfast love, grace, and mercy. We thank you that you forgive iniquity and sin. Heavenly Father, we come to you asking again for our nation that there would be peace, especially this week as one administration leaves and one, a new administration comes into the presidency, Lord, and we know in other places one governor will leave and a new governor will come in. We know there are new senators, new congressmen. We know there are new people coming into all levels of government. And Lord, we pray that there would be peace. We pray that our judges, our president, our senators, our congressmen, Heavenly Father, our state representatives, our governors, our mayors, our city and town council men and women would be blessed. Give them wisdom. Help them to lead well. We would pray for them, Lord. We would pray for their souls, that they would know you and follow you and that they would bow to you and that they would lead wanting to glorify you, Lord. But even for those who are not yours, we pray that you would give them wisdom, that there might be peace in our country that the gospel would be able to go forth, that we would be able to worship you freely. Heavenly Father, we pray for things happening here locally, Lord. We pray that you will bless our town and city governments in the various places we live. We pray that you would bless our health department. We pray that you would give wisdom to our doctors and nurses and that you would bless their work. We pray for lab workers. We pray for pharmacy workers, that you would protect them all as well, but help them to treat our sicknesses, Lord. Lord, as we continue to hear about the rollout of the vaccine, we pray that you would bless it. We pray that those vaccinations would get into the arms they need to get into and that more would come. We pray, as Keith has already said, we're praying for an end to this pandemic. It does seem like it has lasted for so long. Lord, more than even the end of a pandemic, we pray that you would end our spiritual complacency. We pray that you would be at work in us, that we would have a renewed sense of your love, your grace, and your mercy, of the wonderfulness and wondrousness of who you are, that you are the creator God, the God who hung the stars in the sky that calls stars to burn, it calls planets to exist in their orbits. Lord, you have created all the animals, all the birds, fish of the oceans, all the wondrous things we see. The beauty of nature is yours. May we praise you. May we be renewed in a sense that you, that creator God, are also our redeemer who loves us. May that love overwhelm us. And I pray that that love would change us. 
Heavenly Father, we pray that your gospel would go forth. We pray that your gospel would go forth from our mouths and from this church corporately and from your church corporately across the United States and around the world. We pray that you would be calling people we know and love and people we've never heard of, our friends and relatives and loved ones and even our enemies, call them into your kingdom. Holy Spirit, would you do the work of regeneration around the world? We lift up our missionaries. We pray for Curtis and Margaret McDaniel. Would you bless their work at Purdue, especially in this hard season? The same, we pray for Eric and Stephanie Whitley, Lord. Would you watch over them and bless them? For John and Sarah File, we pray that you would be blessing and loving them. For Bert and Nancy Williams, from Tom and Katerina, Lord, we pray for all of them. Provide for them, watch over them, protect them, use them to grow your church, to help church leaders be trained. We pray that you would be growing your church in places like Uganda and Japan and across Europe. Lord, and growing your church here, renewing your church around the world. And Lord, may all these things and so many more be for your glory. Lord, I lift up this congregation. I pray for each person here. I pray for each person who has a worry over a parent or a loved one or a grandparent. I pray for each person here who has worries and troubles at the job. Pray for each family that might have internal problems, Lord. Maybe there's an issue in the marriage. Maybe there's an issue within the family, Lord. Maybe, it's, who knows, Lord? Sometimes we're afraid to say. And yet, Lord, you know. And we pray that you would be at work and that you would do wondrous, redemptive things, making your people to be more like Christ. Again, we pray, may this all be for your glory. And in the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Well, this morning, once again, we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 15. But the focus is going to be on 8 through 11. And then we're going to be done with this section. We're going to move on. But it's such an important section. I wanted us to really look at it. I just want us to really understand it. Let me read to you again the whole section. But again, 8 through 11 is where we'll focus more of our attention this morning. Peter, the apostle, says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. In this way, that there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend, to, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I'll make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you that you are a good and glorious God. 
We thank you and praise you even for this calling you've put upon our lives. Lord, but we need you to help us understand your word. We need uh, you to show us our true selves. So we need you to work this morning. Certainly well beyond me. Would you bless your word? As you have said, would you cause that it would not return to you void, but would accomplish the purposes for which you have sent it forth? So Lord, would you do miraculous things this morning? We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to start by thinking how often it's the case where we are really good, at least we think we're really good at least, at seeing the problems in other people, in other people's lives. It could be something really serious. Maybe you've got a friend who you really have concerns for because they drink too much. They drink too much. Or you know they're using drugs, either abusing legal drugs or using illegal drugs, and you can see it. You worry about it. Maybe you've even talked to them about it. Maybe it's not something illegal, but there's a lifestyle issue and you're concerned about what they eat, right? Or you're concerned about the kind of food they eat. Maybe you think they should change their diet in some way. Or they don't get enough exercise. Or I find we're often great at spotting the problems in someone else's parenting, right? We look at how they raise their kids and we can say, man, they should be doing this. Especially, got to be honest, the younger you are, if you don't have kids, you're an expert at parenting. And then you have them, right? Yet we have a hard time being objective about ourselves. Why do you think it is that when you try to talk to someone about something, they don't want to hear it? And if we're really honest, there's been times people have tried to talk to us about something and we don't want to hear it. Maybe it's even, it's not a friend, but maybe it's a, a boss has said, hey, I want your career to go well. I need to tell you if, you, if you're going to move up in this company, you're going to have to. If you're going to make that promotion, you're going to have to. Do we want to hear it? Do we want to change? Maybe it's a doctor. You know, the doctor says, well, you know, I'm looking at your blood pressure, your lipid count, your weight, your lack of exercise, some category, and they say, you know, you're going to have to change these things. And how often when we hear it, do we go home resentful? We get in the car and say, they don't know anything. And we decide we're not going to change. And I think the same is true for each one of us to at least some degree about our spiritual health. We don't always see ourselves clearly. And the truth is that most of us, if not every single one of us, to some degree, are not spiritually healthy or we're not as healthy as we could be. So I want to remind us quickly of two things. A, and this is all I'll say about, again, about 12 and 15. Peter has been told by the Lord, you're not long for this life. He's probably been ministering as an apostle for about 30 years. He's somewhere outside of Jerusalem, very likely Rome. He's very likely imprisoned. He knows he's going to be killed soon. The Lord has said, you know, you're not going to live very much longer. So as he's writing letters... He's thinking, this is probably the last time I get to say these things. And I want to be clear. So he wants to say the most important things. Secondly, let's not forget where he started. If you go back to verses one and two, let's not confuse what Peter, let's not hear what Peter is not saying. He is not saying your relationship with God is based on your godliness. He's not saying you earn a relationship with God. He's not saying you earn the love of God or even the blessings of God. He's already pointed out where he, in 
one of the most startling things I think the New Testament or any part of Scripture says. Here an apostle says, an apostle of 30 years says, you have an equal standing with us before God because of your faith. You have an equal standing before God with the apostles because all of our standing is not based on our works, he says, but it's based on the righteousness of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes that very clear. And he's going to return to that. But we don't need to start saying, okay, if I don't start pursuing holiness, God won't love me anymore. Or if I want to be blessed, if I want God to, to give me anything good, then I have to go earn it through godliness. However, we are called to godliness. But I wanted to start for a second to thinking about our standing and how it is secured for us by Christ Jesus alone. By his work on our behalf, his righteousness given to us, his paying the penalty. Because if we're not secure in that, we'll never be honest. If we always think that we're secretly earning our righteousness before God, we'll always have to fib. We'll always have to kind of, you know, pump up our resume a little bit, try to look better. But if we know, look, I'm already accepted. I'm already loved infinitely by God. I can't be loved less by God. Then we can be honest with ourselves. Verse 3 is very clear. This is Jesus here. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. The Lord Jesus Christ calls us to his glory and excellence. He's saying, follow me, just like he said to the original disciples. And that means, first and foremost, put your faith in me, trust in me. But secondarily, but important, even saying secondarily makes it sound like it's not, well, it's not as important. No, it's important. Follow me. Model yourselves after me. We can't overlook this. God has always looked on his children, even as he did. We read that passage in Deuteronomy, and he says things like, walk in my ways. Be holy as I am holy. If you love me, keep my commandments. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 13. This is Jesus. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? This is the vine dresser. He answers and says, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is Jesus issuing something that on some level should cause us some concern, saying, I expect you to bear some level of fruit. And this is Jesus saying, if after all that I put into you through the church, through my word, you still aren't bearing fruit, then, then you're a, a dead, useless tree just to be cut down. And in other places, he says, cut down and burned. He's calling on us, just briefly to look at what we looked at last week, to do what, what Peter calls on us. He says, add to our faith virtue. Virtue with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness. Steadfastness with godliness. Godliness with brotherly brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love he called this is peter's way of saying put on the holy spirit or excuse me put on the fruit of the spirit by the power of the holy spirit he is calling us to follow after him so again we're going to focus the rest of our time on 8 through 11 verse 8 for these qualities are yours and are increasing are they ours are we currently putting them on? 
Are we currently trying, striving to live them out and increasing? Are we seeking to grow in them? Now, let me be clear. This isn't saying, okay, from here on out, it needs to be all perfection. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible is very clear that in this life, before we go to be with the Father, where Jesus comes and brings all things to the culmination of the new heavens and the new earth, until that time, we will struggle in sin. We will sin. Everything we do will, on some level be tainted by sin. This is not saying you must be perfect in every way. But it is saying, if these qualities are yours, they should be yours. And they should be increasing. We should be striving to grow to be more Christ-like. If you became a Christian five years ago, after five years, on some level, someone should see some evidence of growth. If you became a Christian 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we should see some evidence of growth. And they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should be truly striving. We shouldn't be ineffective. We should see a desire to be useful for God, to be effective for God, to be fruitful. That's one of the reasons I thought of that passage in Luke 13, because it's parallel. Jesus, again, is saying, if there's no fruit in your life, if we keep coming and inspecting it and there's no fruit in your life, then it should scare you on some level. If you can't find any fruit, any growth whatsoever, on some level it should scare us and we should say, am I truly a believer? Or have I just given kind of mental assent to the gospel. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted. Wait, excuse me. He says, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to produce fruit. Let me give you two illustrations of, of ways that we can go wrong. Even if you hate all the superhero movies, you know that there's a character that exists called the Hulk, right? The basic story of the Hulk is this. He was bombarded by gamma rays, and what happened was is he, he becomes this huge, enormous, like, rage monster with almost unlimited strength. What you probably don't know, I'm going to guess, if you do, great, wonderful. But one of his early villains, like his arch villain, was his exact opposite, right? So the Hulk's like all body, right? He's all muscle. His arch villain was a guy who was bombarded with gamma rays to his brain. And so he's called the leader, and he has this huge, enormous brain like comically huge head with a comically huge brain. So instead of being unlimited power physically, he has almost unlimited mental ability. You know, in, in the old comics, I'm talking like late 60s, early 70s, they used to pit these two guys together. Every blue moon, they try to bring him back, but it's almost too comical to bring him back. But let me, as you think about those two characters, there's a ways we need to go right and we need to go wrong, or we can go wrong. The Bible calls on us to theology, to orthodoxy, to right belief, right? We are to have the right knowledge of God. We are to have the right knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also calls on us for that knowledge to produce fruit. For it to produce godly ethics. For it to produce what's called orthopraxy. Right behavior. Our goal should not be to be one or the other, but to be both. And there's a sense in which I will say most of us that live in what's called the reform world we're not the Hulk. 
we're the leader. Like, I will tell you, what I encounter mostly, and I've now worked professionally as a pastor for 22 years, is people think, well, okay, there's a call to grow. There's a call to be more godlike. I should read some more books. And by the way, I'm 100% all for reading more books. Like, I should gain more knowledge. I'm 100% for gaining more knowledge. But that knowledge needs to produce something. We shouldn't be walking around all, all head just like we shouldn't be walking around all body. Our goal is for a healthy mix, and we could actually throw in, I don't have a superhero or supervillain for the heart, but if there was some way for there to be like a heart villain, that would be, be the last thing. He says, whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Let me, let me offer two interpretations that I, both, I think are both true. It's hard for us to know exactly what Peter meant here, but here's what I think. A, culturally, we can be blind in this way. So the Western church, and I mean Europe, the United States, North America, since the time of the Reformation especially, has focused a lot on doctrinal issue, issues. Who should be baptized? When should pe people be baptized? What mode should they be baptized? What's the meaning of the Lord's Supper? What's the meaning of terms like election? All of those and many others are super important questions. I'm not saying we should ignore them. We should pay attention. We should grow in our knowledge of them. Yet, at the same exact time that the reformers and the, those who followed after the reformers were having all of the debates and writing books and preaching wonderful sermons all the way through men like Jonathan Edwards and following, these wonderful things that were, they were talking about doctrine. the horrors of the African slave trade were happening in those same places. People being captured and beaten, ripped away from their families, sold, treated horrifically, not by people who were, had never heard of Jesus, but by people who literally were preaching the name of Jesus on Sunday They or their servants were beating people on Monday. See, they, they were the leader. They were all about what was going on in the head, and yet they were ignoring a horrific sin right in their own midst. Not just ignoring it, but even participating in it. I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. I can tell you that the most orthodox churches in my hometown were so deeply embedded in Jim Crow and the mistreatment of African Americans through all of the 1900s up to the 1960s and even really continuing into the 70s and 80s in attitudes. The, the most orthodox churches were the ones who most endorsed Jim Crow. Let me flip it around. In the African church, and I'm not trying to make this a white versus black thing, it's just, and this is me reading, following African commentators and pastors. The focus has gone the other way. The focus in the African church for the last hundred plus years has been on ethics and on right living, and because of that, all kinds of horrible doctrine have creeped in. Untrue doctrine. Doctrine that harmed people. There's probably no place on earth that gets more of the heresy of the health and wealth gospel, which is basically like, if you're a good person who has enough faith and prays enough, God's going to bless you with all kinds of money and good health, and all those other things. It's never taken more deep root than it has in Africa. 
You see, you can go wrong both ways. And if you're thinking, well, if I'm going to do one or the other, I'd rather do, you're already wrong. Because the Bible doesn't say it's a binary, like, well, it's okay to go wrong here because, I'd really, because this one's more important. No, we're called to knowledge of the Lord and we're called to godliness. And again, a godliness that's lived out. Second kind of spiritual nearsightedness. We're so obsessed with the world and looking at the world and especially maybe some pet sin in our lives. That's what we talked about a few weeks ago. You know, that sin is so right here that we can't see anything else. And the thing we're not looking at, the thing we're blinded to is God's goodness, God's love, the goodness of his commands. We're refusing in our nearsightedness to take our eyes off of the world and off of, of the temptation, of, off of our sin. That's made us blind. And blindness of any kind in the New Testament is always related to the spiritual. Then he says, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. He says, if you're not actively striving after holiness, striving after Christ's likeness, striving after godliness, and again, I, if you're not striving to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and grow in that, striving to love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemy, if we're not striving after that, he says, then you've forgotten who you are then I've forgotten who I am, that I was cleansed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That foundational standing we've been talking about, that our righteousness is in Christ. If we say, oh, wonderful, if I put my faith in Jesus, then I'll be saved. Then I won't go to hell. I'll have eternal life. I'll, be, I'll have the love of God the Father as his son or daughter. Amazing. And then we turn around and go, okay, now I'm just going to do whatever I want. Okay, Jesus, keep that on hold like an insurance policy. I'll pay whatever dividends I need to, uh, you know, I'll pay whatever premiums I need to pay, but I'm just going to go live and do whatever I want. He's saying, have you forgotten that you were cleansed? You know, I like to tell the story that sometimes I would come home so muddy from football practice when I was growing up, my mom would make me go outside and literally, she would just have me stand there, and I'd still be in my uniform, and she would just take the hose and just spray me down. That was so I could come in. I was, you're, get me just clean enough so I could come in the back door. Well, she didn't say, okay, let me spray you down, and then I'd go roll around in the backyard in some muddy portion. When we continue in our sin, that's what we're doing. You know, let me, let me use that eating illustration. Maybe you've had a doctor or a nutritionist or someone tell you to stop eating something bad. How foolish is it? Let's say you go pay a nutritionist, $150. They, they, they look at your whole diet and they say, well, you need to stop eating this. You need to stop eating that. You need to start eating. And they add us and you go, okay, thanks. And then you drive to the store and you go, okay, I'm going to take two dozen donuts, that box of cookies, and all that candy. And then we go home and go, you know. In this case, we were cleansed from sin. So it's though we were eating rotten food. Food that's started to grow mold and even disease. And we're like, okay, great for telling me. Thanks. Let me just keep eating it. You've forgotten that you are fundamentally a different person. I've forgotten I'm a fundamentally different person when I sin. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. He says be diligent. Diligent, just, that word just in the Greek just means to show care in your work and duties, like to actually care about it. On some level, we need to ask ourselves, am I even, am I even, do I even care whether there's holiness in my life? Do I even care whether I'm growing in Christ's likeness? He says for us to confirm our calling and election. Now, calling is from the Holy Spirit. Calling is the, is the Holy Spirit coming and making the word effective in our lives, 
so that we hear the calling of God, we come to Christ. Election is what God does from all eternity in choosing for himself a people. But how do we confirm it? What does he mean here? He means not confirming to God because God already knows who his elect are and he knows who he's called. He means confirm it for yourself and to others. Character transformation is not the grounds of our relationship with God, but it is the proof of it. That's where we see it. Calling election are beautiful doctrines. From all eternity, God loved a people, right? That's beautiful. God's known he would create me and redeem me from all eternity. There's no beginning to his knowledge of me on some level or of you if you're in Christ. God's had a perfect plan for my life from all eternity. That at some point, he would actually call me to himself. And it's amazing, and it's by his grace, mercy, and love. And let's rejoice in that. But our calling and election is not an excuse to say, well, godliness doesn't matter. All this stuff about walking in his ways, he didn't really mean that. We need to be confirming it to ourselves. When he says, we will never fall. Now, again, we won't be perfect. We may stumble. But falling, he means falling away from Christ. And sometimes, I talk to people and they're like, worried about whether or not they're saved. They worry whether or not they're right with the Lord. Now, my first place I want to point them to is their faith, Right? But the second place I want to say is, well, I mean, what's happening in your life? Not are you perfect. Not are you sinless in everything. But is there any striving towards godliness? For in this way, he says, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal kingdom we've talked about even recently when we looked at Advent, the new heavens and the new earth, the place where there will be no suffering or sadness, where we who are the Lord's will be resurrected even bodily to bodies that cannot break down, bodies that don't need a doctor or a nurse ever because they will be perfectly and always and eternally healthy in a world that does not have brokenness of any kind, sin of any kind, horrors of any kind. That eternal kingdom. And I just want to point out quickly, it is the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's His and it's no one else's and let's not mix it with anyone else's kingdom. It is a kingdom that is separate from the kingdoms of this world. We will receive a rich reward, richly provided for you an entrance into the kingdom. It's more than we will ever deserve. And it's amazing. Let me start back, let's go back to the beginning. Where I said, you know, we're, we're really good at looking at someone else's life. We're really good at looking at someone else's family and seeing the problems. You know, you go to the doctor, you go for your annual checkup or something, they say things like, well, are you eating well? You know, are you getting enough fiber? That's, that's like, I'm at that age, you know, are you getting enough fiber in your diet? You get enough fruits and vegetables? Get enough exercise? You know, how much exercise are you getting? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you doing these things? How often do you drink alcohol? Are you a smoker? All these questions we get asked, they diagnose us and then say to us, well, you need to do this, you need to do more of this, less of that, cut that out altogether. They give us a diagnosis of how we can live a healthier life, a longer life. I want us to close by trying to diagnose ourselves because I can't diagnose you any more than you can really diagnose me. Let's start with our diet our exercise. 
What's your prayer life really look like? I'm not going to go around the room after this and say, hey, what, what? You have to answer that for yourself. Do you even have something you'd call a prayer life? Do you, do you pray at all? I mean, do you, let's start like in crisis. That's when most people turn to prayer. Do you even pray in a crisis? But how about do you pray when there's not a crisis? You have an active, ongoing relationship with the Lord where you're talking to him about your life at all. You know, we live in this amazing time. We take it for granted. We each can own easily a Bible in our own language. That was not always the case for the church. Do we ever use it? Do we ever put it to use at all? Do we ever read it? Are we getting to know it? Are we studying it? Are we thinking over it? Let's look at some things a little more outside. What does your life look like to a person that's not you? Again and again, I've said for the last number of months, I'm not tell, I didn't, wasn't going to tell you how to vote. I'm not telling you how to feel about the candidates. It's not my job. Still believe that. Having said that, if I were to sit down with a coworker of yours or a neighbor of yours, could they tell me exactly what you think about Trump or Biden? Whatever that is. Or if I were to talk to your Facebook friends, would they say, man, I know exactly what that person thinks about Trump or Biden. Yet they would have no idea what you think about Jesus. If people in your life were called to testify and they were read verses five through seven, faith, virtue, knowledge, meaning knowledge of the Lord, Self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, agape love. Again, that's love we looked at last week. That's love that's not about the person you love, but it's love because you love, because you choose to love. So if I asked your neighbor who knows you well, or your cousin who you spend time with, or your coworker, or your wife, or your husband, or your kids. I'm not saying they should be able to say about me, Steve is perfect, because they won't. And they'll know your flaws. But would they be able to say, someone who knows you decently well, or even really well, I see in them a striving towards godliness, towards Christ-likeness. If, if we put in all that data, and you've really, at the end of the day, every person has to do it for themselves. Are you spiritually healthy? And the truth is, again, you're saved by Christ, so you can be honest. And I can be honest. Wherever you are, we're all probably worse than we think. What would it look like to become spiritually healthy? What would it look like to be spiritually healthier? Like, I mean, concretely, what steps in your life could you begin to take? You know, you leave the doctor and he says, man, Steve, you got to lose weight. Dude, that's all there is to it. You got to exercise more. I mean, if I just go, you're right, and then I don't change anything, guess what? When I go back in a year or two years, he goes, man, you still need to lose weight. You need to eat better. This is not about shaming you today. This is not about making, it's about just being honest. What's God calling me to do? He's calling me to this. So what it would look like? What, so if I, I, go, I go home, I, I got to say to myself after the doctor, well, I can't eat this anymore. I need to either throw it out or give it away. 
I need to come up with a concrete exercise plan. I'm either gonna hit the pool or hit the trail or hit the bike or something. Join a Zumba class, whatever, right? Okay, spiritually, what would it look like? And maybe you can't answer that in this, you know, two minutes we have left here. But today, what would it look like for you to be spiritually healthier in a week, in a month, in six months, in a year? What would that look like? And what are the steps you would take to get to that goal? What are the habits and attitudes you want to put on? And what are the things you need to stop doing in your life, stop making excuses for? Now, recently I read a, a, a couple of books on forming good habits and getting rid of bad habits. And one of the things one of the writers said was, every team wants to win the world or national championship or state championship or whatever. But the teams that do it or get close are the ones who work at it. They don't just expect it to magically happen. The people who are becoming more Christ-like, I am fully convinced, are the people who say, I'm going to work at that. And they don't just expect there's going to be like a whammy ray of the Holy Spirit that hits them one day and they're just a totally different person. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, by your grace and mercy, because of your love, because we are your children and you want good things for us, you have called us to godliness. You've called us to your glory and excellence. You have said, Lord Jesus, follow me. Lord, I confess myself, I so often want to go hide from those commands by focusing on your grace and my justification in Christ, Lord. And yet you've said, no, no, you must do this. I'm calling on you to do this. Lord, so many of us are like that. So Lord, produce in us godliness. By your spirit, give us the motivation, give us the will, whatever we need. But Lord, may we be changed. Lord, may we seek to actively love because you've called on us to do it. Lord, would you do this for your glory? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song.
Father in heaven loves you with an eternal love, with an infinite love. Hear this blessing from him. Grace, peace, and love from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.